Welcome everyone to Rehabilitation Sciences Group YouTube channel. And here today we are um, again with uh, another live session on pelvic, pelvic girdle dysfunction. And we have with us Dr. G. N. Somanth. Uh, Dr. Somanth is a musculoskeletal and sports uh, manual, physio manual physiotherapist. He has completed his uh, bachelor's and master's uh, from Rajiv Gandhi University uh, Bangalore. Uh, he is chief, chief physiotherapist from Yasoda Group of Hospital. He is also an academic advisor to uh, uh, Yasoda College of Physiotherapy, Hyderabad. He has conducted uh, various workshops, international, national. Uh, he is internationally trained in uh, ISTM from Canada. He is a dynamic uh, neural stabilization training from Prague uh, Rehab School. Uh, he is also trained in uh, kinesio taping from Netherlands. And he has conducted uh, various uh, uh, national and international workshops in various parts uh, of the world. And uh, we welcome Dr. Sumanth here. You can uh, start the session now, please. Yes, sir. Sir, good morning. Uh, good evening. Good evening, all. Uh, sorry for delay uh, due to some uh, little uh, technical problem. So we'll start with the uh, session. So today topic is uh, pelvic girdle uh, dysfunction. So here the pelvic girdle dysfunction is a uh, very important to the physiotherapist and uh, it is a very miss, uh, it means it's a miss dysfunction in terms of uh, when it turns in with uh, orthopedicians or uh, spine physicians or spine surgeons or neurosurgeons because uh, it is uh, so the pelvic girdle dysfunction problems is very so close to your uh, uh, what uh, the symptoms are very so close to your uh, 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 the problems with uh, discogenic pain. So the most of the time it will be uh, misdiagnosed uh, as a, a discogenic pain. So as a physiotherapist, our uh, clinical examination will be more precise more precise uh, so with that we'll come we, we can diagnose so easily it is a pelvic girdle dysfunction the topic uh, looks a uh, very tiny but it is a very vast topic it is a very vast topic so pelvic girdle dysfunction yeah see uh, the first slide you see the pelvis uh, it is mainly designed uh, to transmit forces from a ground to upper body and from upper body to ground. It is exactly, it is in junction between upper body and lower body. The part is always is under uh, means uh, stress. So you, if you see this, if you see this, see if you see this, this is a pelvis, which is made up of two innominate bones and one sacrum and coccyx. Okay, this each and every innominate bone it is made up of ilium, ischium, and pubis. So in sacroiliac joint, in sacroiliac joint, we have, uh, sorry, in pubic, uh, in uh, pelvic girdle, we'll be having two sacroiliac joints. Okay, we'll be having right sacroiliac joint and left sacroiliac joint and one pubic symphysis joint, one pubic symphysis joint. We'll be having a dysfunctions in sacroiliac region, Okay, and pubic symphysis region. So, so, next, next slide. Okay, back, back. So, if you see here, so when you clearly see the anatomy of sacrum, it is a saddle shaped joint. Okay, this sacrum gets uh, articulates with your innominate bones, it's a biarthrodial joint. So wherever the convexities are there in innominate, at that point in, con, uh, in sacrum, it will be having a concavities. So the stability in sacroiliac joint is mainly we'll get because of that anatomical architecture. And next is the muscles that are surrounding around the sacroiliac joint and ligamentous. So we'll go in detail about this uh, later. Next slide, please. Okay, and other important thing uh, we would like we, we have to see in this is ligaments. So here we have got here we have got anterior plane of sacroiliac ligaments. Here we have got posterior plane of sacroiliac ligaments, 
and this is an intermediate plane of ilia, uh, sacroiliac ligament that is short axial ligament and here we have got sacrotuberous ligament here we have got sacrotuberous ligament and here we have got sacrospinous here we have got sacrospinous ligament all these ligaments will be giving stability to your uh, uh, what apple bicardi and it also plays a very crucial role in maintaining the biomechanics of sacroiliac joint so next so here i would like to uh, read about the one statement it's given by the andrew taylor still it he uh, he is a philosopher osteopath uh, from us so he has given a statement he has given a statement among all our books we have read the most standard book is your grace anatomy so this andrew steller still is a guy in 18th century in us that time he said the sacroiliac joint is a mobile joint he said is a mobile joint but grace anatomy says that is an immobile joint that's a immobile joint but he strongly believed then way back nearly 150 years he strongly believed the sacroiliac joint is a mobile joint but that time he is not having any proof to prove that the sacroiliac is a mobile joint he said that in future many of you will see the many of you feel in future many of you will see the sacroiliac joint is a mobile joint with a uh, proofs but i may not be alive to see that but today generation okay after of uh, many researches after of many researches by kapanji and many researches have been done in zurich university by rheumatology and orthopedic departments and they said the sacroiliac joint is a very mobile joint is a mobile joint but whatever the mobility whatever the mobility that is present in a sacroiliac joint is the limited mobility okay in may, in females the mobility will be 0.9 degrees okay 0.9 mm uh, 0.9 mm in, in male it is 0.7 mm it just we have got 2 degree of mobility in a sacroiliac joint that simple mobility that is enough to create a dysfunction in sacroiliac joint and pubic symphysis joint and that can cause excruciating pain next okay so over the time osteopaths understood and their thought is the sacroiliac joint is one of the source of, of uh, back pain and it can be very well and it it can be treated simple with mobilizations and manipulations of si joint yeah see the most uh, successful model that is given by the freti he said the freti he said this is a innominate bone can move up can move down can rotate anterior can rotate posterior can move out can move in i repeat the freti is a success uh, the freti is a biomechanics he has given one successful model he said the innominate bone can move up can move down can move out can move in can rotate anterior can rotate posterior the same thing can happen in other innominate bone and when it comes to a sacrum when it comes to a sacrum when it comes to a sacrum this sacrum can translate upwards the sacrum can translate downwards the sa the sacrum can tilt on either sides so this is the most successful model given by the freti so these are the movements that are possible in a pelvic girdle and these these movements can result in dysfunctions so when you see the biomechanics when you see the biomechanics when you see the lumbar pelvic rhythm when the person is standing and from there when you tends to move forward when you tends to move bend forward the first thing the lordosis that is present the lordosis that is present in your the lordosis that is present in your uh, lumbar region that will be obliterated okay that will be obliterated then it becomes kyphotic then your innominate then your innominate bone starts moving anteriorly of anteriorly afterwards after the innominate bone uh, moving anteriorly the finally your sacrum tends to move anteriorly when you tends to bend to more than 90 more than 90 degrees at here okay initially the sacrum goes into the nutated position 
Afterwards, the tension will be developed in the sacrotuberous ligaments. Because of the tension that is generated in the sacrotuberous ligament, your innominate, uh, sorry, your sacrum tends to move in counter-nucleated position. I tell you this, if you see, this is the sacrum. If the sacrum tends to move anteriorly like this, okay, this is the base of a sacrum, this is the apex of a sacrum. So if the sacrum moves anteriorly, this is a nutation. If the sacrum moves posteriorly, that is a counter nutation. Okay, next. Yeah. You, uh, if you can see the symptoms of uh, mm, the sacroiliac joint, the patient presents with a severe low back pain. It can be localized to one side or sometimes rarely the sacroiliac joint. The patients can give a clinical picture or complaining of pain on the other side too. It can be a bilateral but mostly it will be a unilateral. The lower extremity, the patient may have a radiating pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness. And the patient may complain of pelvic pain and buttock pain. So sometimes the patient will say he'll be having a hip pain and groin pains. And because of these pain, the patient tends to have some instability in his leg. And because of this pain and instability, the patient tend to have some disturbed sitting patterns and walking patterns. Sometimes the patient pain may refer to genitals, okay, genitals of uh, male or female, and sometimes the pain may radiate to the thigh or it may go till calf, okay. And sometimes the sometimes the, your SLR will be positive. When you see this, when you see this. So most of the time, unless when, when you listen these symptoms from the patient, we think that is a classical IVDP. But unless and until you go and start examining the sacroiliac joint, so then only we can say the pain is, in, is coming from a sacroiliac joint or a disc. So it is the biggest challenge for a physiotherapist to differentially diagnose whether it is an IVDP or a, if it is a classical IVDP, we can say it is an IVDP. If it is a disc bulge, this all the symptoms can be the possible, but these symptoms can be possible with a sacroiliac joint problems, or pelvic girdle problems. This we'll discuss in detail uh, in uh, further slides. Next. See here, first of all, to say, first of all, to say, well, how can we say that this guy is having a, a problem with the pelvic girdle or sacroiliac joint? So here, uh, University of South Australia has uh, given some six tests, okay? Distraction test, uh, provocation, distraction, pro distraction provocation test, thigh thrust of sac sacroiliac joint, Gesslen's test and compa uh, comparison provocation test, sacral thrust test and Febus test. In these six tests, in these six tests, we need to uh, do all these six tests to the patient. Out of, these, out, out of these six tests, the patient should say three tests are positive. So then only we can say the problem could be coming from sacroiliac joint. The problem could be coming from your sacroiliac joint. We need to do all these tests. So once it is confirmed, the problem is from sacroiliac joint, then we need to test a uh, further. That is the most uh, reliable test is a uh, stroke test, a uh, stroke test or March test. In this, in this, should we zoom there? In this, in this test, one uh, thumb should be placed over the S2 spinous process, S2 spinous process. Other thumb should be placed over the PSIS. And we should ask the patient of an affected side, the painful side, to do the hip and knee flexion, to do the hip and knee flexion. While doing this hip and knee flexion, this, the thumb which you have kept at S, uh, sorry, PSIS of affected side has to move downwards. So if we, instead of moving downwards, if this thumb starts moving upwards or if it's got stuck there, if it has got stuck there, then it could be the problem. There is a sacroiliac joint into this thing. If the, the problem could be, uh, so uh, so then there'll be a problem could be the sacroiliac joint blockage. Here, when the sacroiliac joint is blocked, okay, when the sacroiliac joint is blocked, again, it is the time to us to test further, 
to test further okay about just to say the sacroiliac joint pelvic girdle dysfunction it is not the diagnosis okay we need to go and further evaluate evaluate to say what sort of pelvic uh, girdle dysfunction is that okay next so here in dysfunctions we'll be having an innominate dysfunctions sacral dysfunctions and pubic dysfunctions so the differential diagnosis of this innominate sacral and pubic joint dysfunctions is a biggest challenge is a biggest challenge next okay see if you see here when you see here so here so this is anteriorly this is an asis so this asis of either side should be at a same level okay in between two asis you should see an umbilicus when it when you see from posteriorly this is your psis in between two psis this is your s2 spinous process these three with these three should be at one line if there is any uh, if there is any discrimination in between these two uh, in these levels then there could be some issue with a sacroiliac joint next see when it comes to an innominate dysfunction when it comes to a innominate dysfunction so this is your asis this is your asis this is your psis in this innominate tends to move anteriorly like that in this innominate tends to move anteriorly like this the asis will be moved downwards and psis will be moved upwards the psis will be moved upwards and asis will be moved downwards so when it comes to that is anterior innominate rotation dysfunction in anterior innominate rotation dysfunction asis will be moving downwards and psis uh, uh, will be moving upwards when it comes to a posterior innominate rotation dysfunction okay here the psis will be moving downwards and asis will be moving upwards it will be quite opposite to air okay and pir like that they both are different then it comes outflare and inflare in this outflare asis will be moving out okay and psis when this moves out when this moves out see this is your innominate bone when it is moving out okay the fingers are going away your thumb your wrist part is coming close so here it's a, here asis will be going away your psis will be coming close to s2 when it comes to an uh, inflate asis will be coming inside and psis will be going out so when it comes to an upslip your asis and psis they both will be coming up when it comes to a downslip asis and psis will be coming down so here in nominate we will be having air pir outflay inflay upslip and downslip then we'll go and see the uh, what uh, sacral uh, when you we, we, uh, next, next when uh, we go and see the sacral dysfunctions when you see the sacral dysfunctions suppose say this is the posterior part and this this is the posterior part of your sacrum so in here the posterior when, when the base of the this is your base of the sacrum this is your apex of the sacrum so here when your base of the sacrum is moving posteriorly this is your counter nutrated dysfunction okay and next your base of the sacrum is moving anteriorly that is your nutrated dysfunction that is your nutrated dysfunction can tell both like this come that is your nutrated dysfunction next okay you can see you you see this this is your sacrum this is your sacrum in this sacrum in this sacrum suppose this part of this is the superior uh, suppose say this is a right side this is the right part of your sacrum this is your left part of your sacrum in this right part of sacrum can move posteriorly and right superior part of sacrum can move posteriorly right inferior part of sacrum can move inferiorly can move anteriorly next okay next and uh, right superior part of sacrum can move anteriorly and uh, right inferior part of sacrum can move posteriorly next slide please okay here then it will be a diagonal relationship then it will be a diagonal relationship suppose this is your left side 
this is your right side the right part right side of the base of the sacrum can move anteriorly and left side left inferior part of the sacrum can move anteriorly sorry posteriorly so here the sacrum can can tilt like that this uh, this is the axis so this part can move can go downwards and this part can come upwards okay the same thing can happen on other way this part right superior part can come posteriorly and this uh, uh, left inferior part can go downwards so here Dr. Suman, we can't uh, see your screen. Oh, sir, uh, there's some problem, sir. Just I'm yeah. seeing. Uh, okay. yeah. Share your screen again. Yeah, yes, sir. Share it, sir. Yeah. Sir, you can see, sir? No. Sir, no? So now you can see? No, we can see your video. So now my video you can see now, sir? Yes, now we can see. Now yeah, you, can yeah. see. you can just go ahead, please. Yeah, fine, sir. So in sacral dysfunctions, you will be having a nutrated dysfunction. You will be having a counter-nutrated dysfunction. You will be having a sacral uh, tilt dysfunction. Uh, sorry. You will be having a sacral torsional dysfunctions. In these torsional dysfunctions, Okay, either superior part can go anteriorly and this opposite side can come, okay, posteriorly. This can come posteriorly and anterior part can come posteriorly and this can come anteriorly. So like this, we should be careful in checking an assessment. The assessment is mainly that is going to happen with your visual observation and you need to use your two thumbs. You need to use your two thumbs and you need to place over the sacrum and you need to check thoroughly next okay so now so i can give you some simple tips how to differentiate between uh, par and ar in posterior innominate rotation in posterior uh, innominate rotation you see this when the innominate is rotating, you, you can see you can see here the innominate bone, innominate bone and the sacrum. So when the innominate bone is rotating posteriorly, it is creating a compressive force over the sacrum. So when it is creating a compressive force over the sacrum, if this is a sacrum, when it comes, when it is rotating posteriorly, it gives a pressure over the sacrum and the sacrum goes inside. The sacrum goes inside. When the sacrum at this part is going inside, it can create a deep sulcus. It can create a deep sulcus. So when you start examining the patient, when you see a patient uh, from the posterior side, you can see a deep depression over the near, near the uh, PSIS side that clearly indicates that could be a problem with a PIR. That could be a problem. I'm not telling that is a problem. That could be a problem. So you can see a deep sulcus over there and the innominate bone will be rotating posteriorly. In PIR, usually the patients say, uh, the patients uh, will be having a short leg, uh, short leg. And, and here when the, when the innominate is going like this, when it comes to a sacrum, the sacrum it is going inside, the sacrum that is going inside and it will tilt to one side. It will tilt to one side. So that when the patient will be can easily can move. Suppose I be if I'm having a problem with my right side PAR, I can easily move to the left side. I, I don't I won't be having any range of motion limitation to my right side. So here the patients in PAR will be having 
uh, tight hamstrings, they'll be having a uh, tight piriformis and a uh, tight uh, tendo Achilles. So along with the management of PAR, we need to work out on piriformis, hamstrings and tendo Achilles. When it comes to an AR, when it comes to AR, see here, when this bone tends to rotate anteriorly like that, when it tends to rotate anteriorly like that, there'll be some ligamentous connections between uh, uh, what uh, uh, innominate and the sacrum. Because of that lig ligamentous connections, when the innominate is going like that, so this sacrum tends to move superior, that the sacrum tends to, before it has gone inferior like that, now the uh, sacrum tends to move superior. Okay, superior and that sacrum tends to move outwards. So here you don't see any sulcus. In AR, the sulcus is not there. Okay, and the uh, sacrum will be slightly moved superiorly and uh, the patient will present with a long leg and because the sacrum at this end, it will be elevated up. When you do side flexion, your range of motion at the affected side will be limited the affected side will be limited and in this case in this case because of anterior, uh, anterior rotation the patient will be having a right ql and tight or uh, 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 tight uh, quadratus lumborum and tight rectus femoris muscle right rectus femoris muscle in ar group in if, if you see any case with an ar you always check the quadratus lumborum of an affected side and rectus femoris of an affect, affected side. So definitely you can find some tenderness and tightness. You need to work out on those two sides, okay, to get a very good uh, results. So that's the differential diagnosis between AAR and PAR. So here we should be very careful in uh, seeing an assessment. So most of the time the sacroiliac joint is an Uni, uh, sorry, a pelvic girdle dysfunctions or unilateral dysfunctions. If the dysfunction is more, if the dysfunction is more, so here, if my right side, it is going anteriorly like this, okay, and the sacrum, which is present here, okay, if it is going a right side uh, dysfunction, the sacrum will be moving up and it will be coming out. If the sacrum, if it is moving up and it is coming out like that, it is coming out like that, that means on left side, on left side, the sacral lateral aspect of the sacrum that is going in. So left side, you will be getting a sulcus and right side, you are not getting a sulcus. If the dysfunction is bad, you can see a bilateral dysfunctions. So sometimes, sometimes if the dysfunction is more at, sometimes the patients may say, means on your observation, the dysfunction is more obvious on the right, but the patient might be complaining the pain on the left, pain on the left. So you need to, so you need to address the uh, address it uh, very properly, and you should have a uh, you, should, you should have that uh, what you should judge you should, your treatment approach should be very judgmental. So you should find a way. So whether you need to correct a sacrum, whether you are going to correct the sacrum or uh, sorry sacrum on the right side or sacrum on the left side. So it is very easy correct because the sacrum on the right side it has moved out. On the uh, left side, it has moody. So approach for a therapist on the right side, it will be very easy. So you need to, he has to, on right side, as it is moved outwards, you need to place your finger over here and you need to press it to correct the dysfunctions. Next. So here, so as I mentioned you, we have got in denominate, we have got upslip, downslip, outflare, inflate, AAR, PAR, total six dysfunctions. When it comes to a sacrum, when it comes to a sacrum, we have got rotated dysfunction, sacral rotated dysfunction, and sacral torsions. In sacral torsions, usually in simple, we can say PL and PR. PL and PR means posterior lateral, uh, sorry, left posterior and right posterior. Okay, the posterior left and posterior right. Suppose if this is a sacrum, if this is the sacrum, if you divide the sacrum into two parts, if the sacral, if, they, if whatever the sacral torsional dysfunction is, uh, means forget about the nutrition and nutrition, where I'm talking about the diagonal dysfunctions. Okay, say it is a tilt. So if it is, if the tilt is like that, if the tilt is like that, okay, we, so this has come posteriorly out. We say if this is the right side, this is a PR dysfunction. So if this is PR means the right side has come out, posterior right. If the left side has come out, 
posterior left okay that is the dysfunctions so while correcting the dysfunctions now you in a case in a case when you are seeing a guy has come and that guy has having a problem of that guy is having a problem now posterior denominator rotation is having on right side okay and he is having an up slip and he is having an out flare when it comes to a sacrum when it comes to a sacrum he is having a counter rotated dysfunction and he is having a sacral tilt so now we will be confused whether what to touch first whether we need to uh, treat innominate or whether we need to treat the sacrum so in chiropractic principles uh, we, there is an order of spine balance when it comes to ar pair first correct pair okay first correct pair next comes to pl posterior left okay pr or pr so either the patient will be having ar or pr the patient never have ar and pr he will be having either pir or air so here we need to correct either innominate rotational dysfunctions first next go to sacrum in sacrum for then correct uh, sacral torsions then next again come to uh, what innominate then you will be having a correction of out flares and in flares first correct a, a, either if you are having an in flare correct in flare if you are having an out flare correct out flare then next again go to sacrum in sacrum again you will be having an in, uh, uh, rotation dysfunction or counter rotated dysfunction correct that next comes to pubic symphysis this is your pubic symphysis in pubic symphysis also will be you will be having a superior shear dysfunction or inferior shear dysfunction so afterwards correct the pubic symphysis dysfunction so after correcting all this if you are having a coccyx dysfunction definitely correct the coccyx dysfunction too okay see here when you see this when you see this the full your spine is sitting on a base of your sacrum is sitting on your base of a sacrum if there is any change if there is if this is the base this is the foundation for your spine if there is any tilt in the spine it can cause instability in the spine so a long standing uh, sacroiliac or sorry long standing pelvic girdle dysfunction can cause some uh, instability issue in your spine it can uh, so you need to correct those uh, the you need to see the whether all the spinous processes are at a same level or not then you need to correct l5 to l1 t12 to t1 c7 to t3 and uh, 3t to t1 so this is an order of spine balance so the, if you follow the order of spine balance definitely you will get a very good results next so now till now we have uh, uh, spoken about the dysfunctions in the joint so means it's uh, dysfunction in the joint but till uh, the dysfunction can happen with muscular forces or without muscular force here we have got two concepts force closure concept and firm closure concept force closure concept is the muscles that are surrounding the sacroiliac joint okay neurological system myofascial system and a gravity all these structures are working together to keep the joint in position for example for example so this is your pelvis so here you will be anteriorly you will be having a rectus abdominis muscle so if this rectus abdominis muscle will so because if the, if you are having a good strength in rectus abdominal muscle so your pelvic will be held in position it will be held in position if this rectus abdominis muscle becomes weak okay your your innominate bone tends to tilt anterior so if you are having any sacroiliac or pelvic girdle dysfunction it is uh, very important to say that dysfunction is because because of weakness of a muscle or tightness of a muscle okay that is very very important that is your force closure concept next comes is your next comes is your so see this is the muscular stability so your rectus abdominis muscle your gluteus maximus gluteus medius okay and uh, pelvic floor muscles erector spinae multifidus okay uh, thoraco lumbar fascia all these muscles will work all these muscle coordinated work between all these muscles helps the helps in keeping the joint in position if there is any weakness or tightness in these muscles can cause a dysfunction in the joint so it's our duty to identify which muscle is at fault 
so then we should give a proper prescription to whether we need to stretch the structure or strengthen the structure so next is your form closure concept the form score first score in this form closure concept as i said you in the beginning so uh, see this because of the anatomical architecture of your sacrum and innominate as i said it's a saddle shaped joint it's a biarthrodial joint so the stability is because of the fixation the stability is because of the fixation sometimes in spite of having a very good muscular control muscular strength around your pelvic girdle okay in spite of having that also still we can see some dysfunctions in the sacroiliac joint for example a sports guy cricketer who is standing at a boundary when the batsman hits a six okay when the ball is going okay crossing the crossing the boundary line if he jumps and catches the ball while coming down if he starts landing on one leg okay it because the, the the force starts transmitting from one leg and it can create some shear forces in a joint okay that can cause the dysfunction so it is a so the biggest challenge for the physiotherapist is when the physio, when the patient comes to us when he ex, when we take his history and after everything has happened the, the first question the patient has asked is okay how many days i am going to be fine okay it is a very difficult for any physiotherapist to precisely to say so you are going to be well in 7 days 10 days so there, there should be some hypothesis there should be some clinical reasoning behind that and there should be some analysis behind that to say 7 days or 10 days so for me okay if i see a case of a form closure dysfunction okay only osseous only a uh, joint issue where the muscular control is very good i can say hopefully you'll be fine in 3 days hopefully you'll be fine in Three days. So when it comes to a form closure, a uh, force closure dysfunction, so that is because of some weakness. Then I will say the patient, the fifty percent of pain I can help you within a week or so. The rest, uh, the the uh, the rest it will take the two or uh, three or four weeks until you have because you have got a dysfunction because of some muscular weakness. So till your muscle becomes strong, you'll be going to face some problem. Uh, you'll you'll be going to get some onward of pains, but you keep doing exercise. So so we need to be very careful in talking to a patient and uh, explaining them. Uh, when, when, uh, about the outcomes so we should uh, we should predict uh, we should go with some reasoning and we should tell to them next so next uh, when it comes to a force closure concepts and uh, here we have got a posterior uh, uh, force closure concepts uh, when the how the muscular uh, system is going to control your uh, stability of your uh, sacroiliac uh, joint here we have a posterior sling system that is your longitudinal system anterior oblique system and posterior oblique system when it comes to an anterior post sorry posterior sling system when it comes to an posterior sling system okay here we will be having a multifidus muscles here we will be having a multifidus muscles here and we will be having a thoracolumbar fascia the thoracolumbar fascia deep muscles of fascia of thoracolumbar fascia will be getting united with your uh, multifidus muscles and your multifidus muscles will uh, muscles uh, in uh, it will be having an eponeural connections with your uh, longata biceps so uh, femoral biceps femoral biceps and uh, sacro tuberous ligament so here here the uh, sacral part of multifidus uh, here the sacral part of uh, multifidus muscles when these tends to contract when these tend to contract Okay, when these tends to become short, they, you are more prone to cause nutrated dysfunctions concepts. You are most prone to cause nutrated dysfunction concept. So we, it is very important for a physiotherapist, okay, to see not only to correct, uh, manipulate, and mobilize and correct the dysfunction. Not only that, on top of that, you need to see the sling systems, okay, for long tunnel sling system posteriorly. We need to check whether there is any tenderness in the thoracolumbar fascia. whether there is a uh, means we need to check the multifidus functioning we need to check a uh, tightness of sacrotuberous ligament you need to check uh, tightness of hamstring muscles you need to check uh, uh, you need to check all these muscles okay if you find any tightness you start uh, releasing those muscles okay it, it, your outcome will be very good next it comes your anterior sling next 
Next, next it comes here. Uh, sorry, posterior sling. In this posterior sling, in this posterior sling, suppose the latissimus dorsi of your right side will be connected to your gluteus maximus. So it will be lattice, uh, uh, latissimus dorsi of your right side will be getting connected to the gluteus maximus of uh, left gluteus maximus. It is then a, a posterior oblique sling. So that sling system also you need to check. Okay, so whether if there is any tightness of uh, uh, latissimus dorsi, okay, there can be a poor functioning of your gluteus maximus because the connection is your posterior oblique sling. So to improve the function, if the gluteus maximus is not functioning effectively, obviously your sacroiliac joint loads will be more. Obviously, your sacroiliac joint will be more and it's going to get affected. So to improve your sacroiliac joint, so you have to improve the flexibility of your latissimus dorsi muscle, then you need to go with strengthening protocols of your gluteus maximus muscles. Okay, for an effective, uh, for, for good results. Next. Next, it comes to your anterior sling. Next, it comes to your anterior sling. In anterior sling, uh, we'll be having an external obliques and internal oblique muscles as a one sling, and they'll be getting uh, attachments with your transverse abdominus muscle. So when these muscles are not working effectively, when these muscles are not working effectively, definitely the load of uh, the, the definitely the loads on your sacroiliac joint will be more. So it is very important. See the external obliques, internal obliques, transverse abdominus. These are the muscles, they are more prone for uh, weakness than rather than tightness. Your latissimus and dorsi muscle is more, more prone for tightness. Your gluteus maximus muscle is more prone for weakness. So you need to check this link system, posterior longitudinal system, posterior oblique uh, sling system, anterior oblique sling system. So you need to check the, uh, you need to have an assessment of these group, okay, for a better outcomes. Okay, so uh, so and uh, the most important thing is, and the most important thing is here. This is your diaphragm. This is your diaphragm means uh, pelvic diaphragm, uh, pelvic floor diaphragm, and here you'll be having a respiratory diaphragm, respiratory diaphragm. If the pelvic floor diaphragm and respiratory diaphragm, these two are interconnected with your oblique systems, external oblique muscles, internal oblique muscles, and transverse abdominal muscles and rectus muscles and uh, see if there is any weakness of your uh, 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 what uh, if there is weakness of any uh, any weakness of your pelvic floor muscles there will be an uh, there will be an inefficiency of your what uh, uh, abdominal muscle groups abdominal muscle groups it can also cause excessive stresses on sacroiliac joint as I said, you, I, didn't, I haven't gone in detail about the sling system. So it is very, very important, okay, uh, while examining the sacroiliac joint, it is very important to examine uh, your uh, pelvic floor uh, and diaphragm also. So if your diaphragm, when you inhale, the diaphragm has to, okay, should bring a good posterior lateral expansion. If, if you are having an uh, upward some posterior respiration, it indicates that your uh, what uh, diaphragmatic function is not good. Your diaphragmatic function is not good. If you're having a superior lateral expansion, that clearly indicates that your uh, diaphragmatic function is good. If your diaphragmatic function function is poor, definitely you'll be having a poor function of your external obliques, internal obliques, rectus abdominis. Okay, if this muscle is weak, and definitely you'll be having a poor firing of your pelvic floor muscles. Okay, and your posterior, uh, posteriorly, your erector spinae and multifidus, they are prone for becoming a tight. When it becomes tight, as we know, the multifidus are rich in uh, proprioception, and uh, means the proprioception, uh, uh, the proprioception of your spine will be going to get affected, and definitely your response to any unexpected movements. Okay, unexpected movements won't be so great. So you tend to cause more stresses on a sacroiliac joint and this, they, they go into a dysfunction. So when you, so, so most of the time uh, I work uh, closely with uh, spine surgeons and uh, 
uh, neurosurgeons they support me a lot okay to convince them uh, regarding this uh, that is a there will be a problem like a sacroiliac dysfunction pelvic girdle dysfunctions it took me 6 years okay it took me 6 years see see uh, we, we are doing uh, studies uh, in this pelvic girdle uh, dysfunctions see most of the time when you see a per, when you see a people complaining of pain in the low back and radiating so definitely the first option of assessment is uh, rest and some physical therapy if it's not getting uh, if it's not getting corrected then uh, doctor may ask you for mri so in that mri if you see unfortunately that guy is having a problem in the disc it's a disc bulge okay it's if he's if that guy is having a problem with a disc bulge so our uh, line of treatment completely shift towards the disc okay but here we should be very careful in telling the source of pain is from the disc or the source of pain is from the sacroiliac joint uh, sacroiliac joint or pelvic girdle joint so here you should use carefully your examination methods means mckenzie examination methods whether the disc is the source or use all these uh, whatever i said whatever i discussed you no know, uh, to provocating test whether the pain is coming from the sacroiliac joint but unfortunately sometimes we'll see the mixture okay when we see the mixture it is again biggest challenge for the physiotherapist whether to stabilize the lumbar first or whether to say stabilize the sacrum first so th these are the challenges uh, we are going to face in uh, treating a, a patient so so here uh, we have got a great scope uh, in managing these things so try to go and talk to your uh, physicians uh, surgeons and try to explain about the differential diagnosis between uh, pelvic girdle dysfunctions and uh, uh, what are discogenic pains if you if you are having an independent practice also so educating a patient is a very toughest job educating a patient is also toughest job because so you try to convince them the patient uh, you you are having a pain you are getting a pain from the sacroiliac joint so the patient never bothers and he will take his mri and he will show sir i'm i'm having a disc bulge i'm getting a pain from disc so, so the convincing the patient making them to understand it's a tough job for uh, for us so we need to we, we need to do examination carefully at the same time we need to convince the patient and we need to take the patient into confidence and then only we can treat a patient so that uh, we will get some good results next so when it comes to an altered uh, mechanics uh, so when you uh, so when, when here if you see this superior sacral foramina here you have got a piriformis muscle uh, obturator muscle okay superior gemellus inferior gemellus and uh, sac uh, what uh, uh, sciatic nerve so sup suppose unfortunately if you are having uh, the sacral dysfunction so we all know we all know your piriformis muscle will take origin from the anterior aspect of your sacrum okay if there is any change in the position of the sacrum either the nutation or counter nutation there will be a there will be a tension in the piriformis will be created but uh, the tension can sometimes cause undue pressure on your uh, uh, sciatic nerve and the patient typically complains of low back pain and the pain is radiating down through the leg so down through the leg and uh, so most of the time again we think it is an ibdp again go further evaluate again you if you say it is a piriformis syndrome if you think the piriformis syndrome also only the piriformis stretches are going to help whether the already the, the piriformis is stretched okay because of the piriformis over stretch it's giving a pressure on your sciatic nerve okay it's giving a pressure on your sciatic nerve so when to stretch a piriformis muscle when to just uh, Uh, correct the just sacrum and get the length of piriformis into correct position that that will solve issue that judgmental things uh, should be uh, very very um, uh, the, the judgmental things should be very obvious you should uh, give a correct uh, protocol to the uh, patient next next so usually so uh, so we can't say it is an sacro joint dysfunction or we can't say it is an pelvic girdle dysfunction so the final uh, uh, when you say it is a pelvic girdle dysfunction sacro joint dysfunction we should say can we say it is an sacro joint dysfunction 
no we can't say that it should be a, for example i am telling so we can say it is a right uh, anterior innominate rotation dysfunction with up slip and out out flare and right innominate bone with a sacral nutation uh, sacral nutation dysfunction with force closure dysfunction due to gluteus ma- uh, medius weak, uh, weakness so i am t- uh, giving you an example so we, when we tell that is a pelvic girdle dysfunction we should our diagnosis should be that much big big in length okay so so that uh, we we can uh, we know or uh, we know what we can do so we so here we need to correct the innominate dysfunction we need to correct the innominate uh, sorry, sacral dysfunctions in this again judgmental whether to correct uh, in, uh, right innominate uh, sorry whether to correct to innominates uh, rotational dysfunctions or sacral dysfunctions as i said you before there will be an order of spine balance correct the order of spine balance okay if it is all this dysfunction has come because of some weakness of muscle you target that muscle use some strengthening protocols if that muscle is weak definitely that opposite muscle will have become tight you go with the stretching protocols of that muscles you good motor control uh, motor relearning programs to that uh, particular exercise groups and try to stabilize your uh, uh, pelvic girdle i didn't uh, mentioned your uh, pubic joint dysfunctions so this uh, pubic joint dysfunctions here also you can see okay superior shear dysfunction and the uh, inferior shear dysfunction suppose if your anterior innominate rotation dysfunction is very obvious it is an it is a linked structure when it is go like that there you can see an inferior shear dysfunction when it goes posterior obviously you can see a superior shear dysfunction when the patient is having a pelvic floor um, sorry pubic symphysis dysfunctions the patient while walking on uh, if uh, so uh, on a stance phase okay he will get a pain on his pubic symphysis genitals will be painful okay genitals will be painful so rolling on a bed so rolling on a bed will be very painful okay coming out of the car or going inside the car okay it will be painful for them so when it comes to uh, so most of the time pubic uh, joint symph- uh, symph- uh, symphysis dysfunctions are very very well corrected with a simple mobilization techniques or you can use some uh, muscle energy techniques of adductors and abductors to correct uh, to correct the shears so after talking all these things the again the treatment is a big very big topic so here you got mulligan so here you got mulligan concepts maitland concepts some osteopaths concepts some muscle energy technique concepts some chiropractic concepts what are concept you follow every concept helps in uh, getting a good results when your diagnosis is perfect okay thanks so here ignoring the sacroiliac joint in low back pain is very very costly and it misleads the treatment okay david uh, pole and daily chell in department of orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery in university of minnesota said this so they said okay do your sacroiliac joint examination thoroughly suppose as i said you before if you have got a disc bulge and if you are having a sacroiliac joint dysfunction but unfortunately your si joint is not diagnosed well okay you are more prone for getting operated for the disc bulge okay so we are where you are not getting a good uh, uh, results okay thank you thank you thank you dr suman for explaining a pelvic girdle dysfunction Uh, i would appreciate uh, ki in a very simple manner in a very pictorial manner you explain us about the pelvic disc, uh, disorders and uh, i would think that you have tell us how to differentiate air and tir it is extremely good and i would say in tmc it is very good how to diagnose so the main thing is our diagnosis should be good and if our diagnosis is good then any treatment choice could be worked out that is the our take away message is there ki our diagnosis should be good because that's why uh, sometimes there is a patient uh, is suffering up from the si joint dysfunction and we try to treat the only the lumbar dysfunction so it is very important first diagnosis should be there then only we should go for the treatment uh, dr sumanta there was a question was there what is the role of the squaring of pelvis in dysfunction and limb length discrepancy 
What sir? I didn't get you. Uh, there was a question. What is the role of squaring of pelvis in disjunction and limb length discrepancy? Sir, I, I didn't get you. Uh, uh, a person was oh, okay. uh, asking, what is the role of squaring of pelvis? Okay, and okay, fine, sir. Uh, okay. Disjunction in the limb and discrepancy. Uh, oh, yeah, got it, got it, sir. Sir, uh, squaring of pelvis uh, in correcting the pelvic joint dysfunctions, uh, I think uh, it won't be, means uh, it won't be not that much appropriate. First, we need to see why there is a limb line discrepancy. So as I said to you from the beginning, okay, in AAR, your innominate tends to rotate anteriorly. With that, there will be a little shortening of your, uh, uh, little lengthening of your, uh, what a leg will be there. When it comes to your PR, it moves posteriorly, there will be a little shortening. So when you correct the Perfect. simple dysfunction, when you correct the simple dysfunction, the lip blend discrepancy will be get corrected. So afterward, that also, if you, after, after correcting that also, if you still find there is some limb blend discrepancy, then you need to check up a pelvic uh, squaring of uh, pelvis. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Thank you. Uh, for coming on to the rehabilitation science group and we will request you ki you should take more and more lecture on to the pelvic girdle and in the series you should take up the uh, PIVD also so that uh, yes, in the series we can find it out the differential diagnosis with the lumbar back pain and the uh, SI joint dysfunction. Sure sir, sure sir. My pleasure sir. Thank you very much.